Okay, uh, so we're going to get started today. Uh, welcome back to CSE 691 Topics in Reinforcement Learning. I am going to be giving today's lecture. Uh, so the first four lectures of this course were sort of like a uh, a coarse grain overview on what uh, we're going to be covering in this course in more depth. And so the next series of lectures starting from today is going to be a more focused look at each of the topics that we looked at in uh, the first four lectures of the course. So today we're going to be focused on revisiting finite horizon dynamic programming problems. And we're also going to cover deterministic rollout in much more depth. Okay, so. Okay, so here's the outline of today's lecture. So first we're gonna cover uh, finite horizon problems and their relation to infinite horizon problems. So in the last couple of, the le couple of lectures, all of the uh, intuition and uh, visualizations that we developed uh, were related to approximation and value space for infinite horizon problems. We want to show you how uh, finite horizon as can inherit all of this uh, intuition as well. So to do this, we're going to show a construction on how we can uh, reduce any arbitrary finite horizon problem into a corresponding infinite horizon problem and therefore inherit all, inherit all of the properties that we like. Uh, oops. Next, we're going to cover uh, rollout in general in greater detail. And then specifically, we're going to look at rollout for deterministic finite state problems. And then uh, in part four, we're going to look at the more theoretical aspects of rollout under what conditions is rollout expected to perform well and what can we say about it. Then we're going to take a break. And then the last portion of the lecture is going to be uh, devoted to deterministic rollout variants and extensions. Okay, so we'll start with finite horizon problems. Uh, let me remind you, uh, as review, what the generic finite horizon dynamic programming problem looks like. So we're given this state space and control space, and at a specific state xk, we have a, a system equation defined f of k, which takes uh, in a state fk, a control uk, and some random variable wk, and it spits out the other side, uh, the next state, xk plus 1. So WK represents this random disturbance, which can uh, represent things like physical noise, market uncertainties, demand for inventory, or other unpredictable factors in the dynamics of your system. Uh, we have this cost function. So the, the transitions here are random and the costs are random as well. They're both functions of this variable WK. The cost function uh, at a state XK uh, is defined by, or is uh, labeled as GK. It takes in the state, it takes in a control, and a random disturbance and, and spits out a, a real valued cost. So the cost function here, since in general, we'll look at stochastic problems, but it could be deterministic, uh, is defined by the sum of all costs along the control trajectory given by the, uh, the, the sequence of controls starting from the initial state. Then we add to it uh, a termination cost, uh, G of N. We take the expected value of this, and this is the cost of a, a particular control trajectory. A policy uh, given by pi is something that's generated when, uh, sorry, when um, it, it, it's a set of functions m zero to m n minus one, where each of these is a state dependent function that output that outputs an action. And the reason we need policies for stochastic problems is that an uh, an optimal or sorry a control sequence will not suffice because if I am at a particular state x k, I apply a control where I end up in xk plus one is not necessarily deterministic. So the next control in my control sequence may not necessarily apply to where I am. So instead we have a policy, which is a sequence of functions uh, that's, that's sort of like a lookup table. It says, if I'm at a, a particular state, I, produce, I, uh, I apply a particular control, which is the output of the, these functions mu. Then for a given initial state x zero, the cost of a the state at x0 under a particular policy pi is given by this cost function here. And our objective is to minimize the cost function. So we compute j star from x0, which is a minimization over all possible policies pi. And then the optimal policy, which we call pi star, uh, has this cost j pi star, which we just shorthand as j star from the initial state x0. So we'll be focusing on finite horizon problems because it's uh, most convenient for our algorithmic purposes. So we can talk about rollout, et cetera. 
uh, and it's just easier to talk about, but uh, as a matter of concept, nearly everything we talk about for finite horizon problems will apply to infinite horizon problems as well. Okay, so let's review the end stage dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, this is an algorithm that produces optimal costs at the estate uh, xk called jk star, and it's the optimal cost of the tail subproblem that starts at xk. So in, in exact dynamic programming, we start at the end of the horizon and work backwards. So we start with the uh, terminal cost, uh, g of n xn, and then we work backwards to compute the optimal cost of the tail subproblem starting at each uh, state at each stage xk. And uh, it's computed as the minimum over the set of controls. And we take the expected value of a particular state and control pair plus a uh, random disturbance. And this is representing the immediate cost of taking a particular action at a particular state. And then we add the optimal cost to go. So the optimal cost of the tail sub problem starting at the next state. And we do this for all XK. Uh, so layer by layer, we do this for all states. The optimal cost J star X of zero is obtained in the final step once we reach the front uh, or the uh, first stage of the uh, of the problem. And J zero star of X zero is just J star of X zero. Then once we've gone backwards, uh, we go forwards. The optimal policy is obtained using uh, minimization in the same way. We take, uh, we have the optimal cost at each stage computed for each state. And we take the arg min over the set of controls to obtain an optimal control sequence going forward from stage zero all the way to the end. So that is the uh, exact dynamic programming algorithm for n stages. Now, sometimes solving this problem, actually often, uh, can be intractable. The, the state spaces can be very large, and uh, we may not be able to compute it at any reasonable amount of time. So for this, we turn to approximation and value space. Uh, here, there is no going starting from the end and moving backwards and then going forwards. We only go forward. So we start at the beginning and we choose our control, uh, UK tilde, as the argmin over these set of controls in a similar way, where we take the expected value of the corresponding state and control pair. And then we add the cost to go. But the cost to go, JK plus one tilde, is an approximation of jk plus one star, and it's obtained in some way. There's also a multi-step version of this where we solve this um, exact dynamic programming problem with a limited depth, and we use this jk star, uh, jk say plus l star as a terminal cost uh, for each of the leaves of this dynamic programming calculation. So uh, there are many possible ways to compute jk plus one tilde, in fact, 90% of the field of reinforcement learning is looking for ways to compute this. And uh, some examples of how you might compute this is using uh, some kind of problem approximation, offline training via a neural network, or you may use heuristics online to approximate JK plus one tilde. Uh, are there any questions so far? Okay. So I want to compare uh, finite horizon problems to infinite horizon problems so we can inherit all the, inherit all the good intuition. But let me first remind you of uh, how infinite horizon problems work. So again, we have a state and control space. And at a state xk, uh, we have the system equation that brings us to the next state. And again, we have a random cost. But the random cost has this factor in front of it, alpha of k. Here, there's an infinite number of stages and a stationary system and costs. So in the uh, uh, finite state or finite stage dynamic uh, programming problem, each of these functions, the cost function G and the uh, system dynamics uh, F uh, were subscripted with this K because it might matter uh, what your cost is and what the next state you should go to. It may be stage dependent, but in the infinite horizon case, uh, the number of stages is always infinite. It's always the same from, from state to state. So we don't have these subscripts. So then the cost of a policy pi, uh, which is a sequence of functions, uh, is given by this sum of uh, uh, immediate costs given a particular policy. And uh, it's a sum of n costs. And But we take the limit 
as n approaches infinity. So it, uh, yeah, so so this is the cost in the limit. And, uh, okay, I'll explain alpha later, but the optimal cost function J star of X zero is obtained by obtaining the, uh, uh, looking over all policies and obtaining the minimum. And uh, the Bellman equation is given by this. So the optimal cost at a particular uh, state X is a is the solution to this uh, nonlinear functional equation, which is called the Bellman equation. Okay, so the nice case is uh, these so-called discounted Markov decision problems, or MDPs. Uh, this is the case where you have finite state and action spaces, and where uh, alpha is less than one. If alpha is less than one then this sum as n goes to infinity is going to converge to a specific value because the terms of this sum decay geometrically. Uh, another nice case is the stochastic shortest path problems. Here we have a finite state and a finite action space, but alpha equals one. To, preve to, to, prevent, the, um, to prevent the problem from going on forever, uh, we have this cost-free absorbing state, which represents a, a goal or a termination state where we can end the process uh, as soon as we arrive at this state. Okay, so uh, how do we compute uh, the solution to Bellman's equation? Bellman's equations, there are two workhorse algorithms. Uh, the first is uh, value iteration, uh, where we uh, apply this Bellman operator iteratively over and over again to the cost function until we converge to J star. And the second one is called policy iteration. This one generates a sequence of policies mu k uh, and their cost functions j mu k, where the initial policy or the base policy mu zero is arbitrary. So the system starts with a policy mu and generates a new policy mu tilde in two steps. So first there's the policy evaluation step, which computes j mu, uh, which is the cost function of the base policy mu. Then there's the policy improvement step, so uh, we obtain a policy improvement by doing a, a one-step look ahead, and we update the policy by uh, finding the min the argument of this this function here, the the minimum the control corresponding to the minimum uh, expected costs. Uh, I'll point out uh, it will be important later that rollout is just a single iteration of policy iteration, and uh, and it can be performed online. Uh, the so the policy evaluation part is uh, performed online with online simulation as needed. Okay. So now we come to the connection between uh, all separate questions. Do you guys have questions? Why are there um, mu of x is in the margin? Um, because there might be multiple policies corresponding to the the minimum cost to go, so we view the um, the set uh, the, the the set of of, of minimum Q factors. We, we view the minimum Q factors as belonging to a set. So we say the 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 uh, optimal policy is an element of the argument, which is a set. And it's like that smaller. Yeah. And we also assume that the Ws are the IDs. Uh, we don't, I don't make any assumptions on them. I mean, it may be necessary to make those depending on what your problem is, but they're, it's just some random variable that's stage dependent. Okay. Okay. So now for the reduction. So we're given this, uh, finite state, uh, finite horizon problem, and we need to transform it into a infinite horizon problem that's equivalent. So for the infinite horizon problem, I need four elements. I need a state space, a control space, I need the system dynamics F, and I need a cost function G. So the way we're going to generate these is as follows. The state space is given by a union of these sets. And what are these sets? Uh, big X sub K is going to be all of the states available at stage K from the finite uh, horizon version of the problem. And so we're going to take the union of all of these. And so in this sense, in the finite horizon case, if you have a state, let's call it X, uh, at a particular stage, K, in the finite horizon case, it's the same state if it's XK plus L, for example, some other stage. But in the infinite horizon case, we're just going, in this construction, we're going to, we're going to treat XK and XK plus L 
as two distinct states. So the stage is sort of wrapped up in the state in this uh, infinite horizon construction. Okay. All right. Then we're going to add this termination state T to the union. And that's our state space. The control space, simil similarly, is going to be the union of all of those capital U subcase, which was a function that gives you back all of the controls that are available to you at state X, uh, X sub K. So that's the control space. Uh, the system dynamics are going to be taken directly from the finite horizon, pro uh, finite horizon problem. So I mentioned that XK and XK plus whatever are two distinct states in this uh, construction. So to define F of XK, uh, UK, I can just use this exact, this exact definition from the finite case. Uh, let me find it. This function here, I can just I can just say that that's what this f is. Similarly, for the con, uh, for the costs, I give it this this cost as well. So then, in this construction, if I'm going to construct a trajectory, if I start from some initial state in x zero, then the system dynamics are going to necessarily put me in some state then uh, that's in the next stage uh, corresponding to the finite horizon problem. So if my state is x k. My next state is going to be some other state in stage k plus one from the uh, finite horizon problem. So in this uh, diagram, a trajectory would go up and to the left like this until we get to the nth stage, at which point we arrive at this termination state. Uh, once we get to this termination state, we go horizontally like this. And the cost of these arcs here are just zero. So in the in this construction, we solve the problem in at most uh, in n plus one steps, where we get to this uh, termination steps, and then it's cost free until the end of the horizon. So this is a this is so in this case the Bellman equation for the infinite horizon problem is exactly equal to the uh, end stage dynamic programming algorithm, and so it's e it's fairly easy to see that these two problems are equivalent, and this is an infinite horizon problem because the costs going into the future are just zero. Uh, OK, are there any questions about that? OK. Well, uh, like this construction, um, you're saying it's only possible to answer the correct No, you can take an arbitrary finite horizon problem and transform it into a specific infinite horizon problem. So in other words, any finite hor horizon problem can be viewed as an infinite horizon problem. And, and what does that mean? It means all of the uh, analysis and intuition we developed from uh, infinite horizon problems, uh, in particular Newton's method, that all applies to uh, finite horizon problems as well. So that, that was the point of showing you this. Any other questions? OK. Uh, so now we'll move on to rollout in general. So rollout is a special case of approximation and value space. So at a state x k, we perform this dynamic programming minimization. We minimize over the set of controls and compute the expected costs for each state control pair. And we may have an L step look ahead, which again, we solve this sort of depth limited exact dynamic programming problem where the termination costs are given by this JK plus L tilde. This represents the future costs. And we call this the base policy costs. So once we perform this minim minimization, we obtain a control. And this control is, uh, we call UK tilde, the rollout control. And the rollout policy maps to this rollout control at a particular state XK. So the future cost or the base policy cost is obtained uh, by some, uh, uh, th this cost is obtained by some policy or heuristic that we simulate, uh, maybe for a limited number of steps or perhaps to the end of the horizon in, in the case of a finite horizon problem. So the policy used for rollout is called the base policy. That's, the, that's this. And the policy obtained by a look ahead minimization is called the rollout policy. Um, there may be approximation variance. You, you, as I meant, as I kind of alluded to just now, uh, 
you the computing the base policy might be something that's expensive or something that you can't do for too long. And so you might do this thing called truncated rollout, where you limit the amount of time you spend uh, simulating the base policy. Um, in this case, you'd have some kind of cost function approximation, and uh, you'd have an approximate base policy cost. Okay. So I want to say a few things about why rollout is important for this course and what the role of rollout is. So it provides important options for cost function approximation in the context of value space methods. It's good because rollout approximates the optimal cost from above. And as we saw in our visualizations, uh, it's important to approximate that cost from above because if you approximate it from below, you might run into stability issues. If your initial cost is too far to the left of the optimal cost, you might, end, you might start with an unstable policy and you won't converge as desired. On the other hand, if you start to the right, in other words, you approximate it from above, you don't have this issue. Uh, it's, as I mentioned before, it's the basic building block of the fundamental policy iteration algorithm. And more importantly, it's an algorithm that can be run online in the sense that the full trajectory can be computed without any offline, op uh, offline computation. Uh, this can't be done in general with policy iteration if you have more than one iteration because that would require updates from states that you're not currently visiting. So policy iteration is done offline. On the other hand, you may do approximate policy iteration where you use some neural network to predict the, um, the intermediate policies, and that's an option too. So why will rollout be important? Uh, so in its peer form, it's the reinforcement learning method that's easiest to understand and apply. It's not hard to see why, given some base policy, you can make some kind of improvement just simply by doing a, a look ahead. Uh, moreover, um, it's really easy to implement. It's easy to code. There are a lot of uh, really complicated methods out there to solve very niche problems. And uh, these methods, as complicated as they are, they can be a bit flaky, we call them, meaning uh, they don't generalize well to other contexts. On the other hand, uh, rollout is by far the most reliable. We've seen the connection between approximation and value space and Newton's method, where uh, the cost of going from the cost of the base policy to the cost of the rollout policy amounts to a Newton step. Rollout's also very general. Uh, it applies to deterministic and stochastic problems and to finite and infinite horizon problems. And as I mentioned, it's a special case of approxima approximation and value space, and therefore it has this connection to Newton's method. Uh, it deals well with online replanning and it provides a useful alternative to reoptimization in adaptive control. It also has a, a, a deep connection with model predictive control and can be used to improve the stability of model, model predictive control schemes. Um, some more complicated methods like Q learning, aggregation, and approximate policy iteration and others can be used in conjunction with rollout, in particular if you do this truncated rollout. Uh, so there's two ways that you can combine methods. You can use your method of choice as a base policy on which rollout can improve, potentially, uh, or you can use these methods as a cost function approximation in the case of uh, truncated rollout. Uh, I'll just say a couple things about uh, your project. I'm going to talk a little bit later, like near the end of the lecture. But uh, if you're somewhat new to the field of reinforcement learning, uh, we strongly recommend that you consider rollout as your methodology if you're going to do a, a mini research project. As I mentioned, it's, uh, it's much easier to code and it's more likely to work with, an, with any given problem. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a favorite, uh, a favorite like 12 letter acronym of your favorite algorithm or whatever, and you want to uh, apply it to some very niche problem, uh, knock yourself out. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about this so far? Okay. Okay. So uh, next, we're going to look at rollout for deterministic and finite state problems. So let's review the uh, deterministic optimal control problem. So again, we have a state space and we have a system equation. But this system equation, it takes in a state and a control only. There's no random variable. So given a state and a control, the next state is determined, uh, xk plus 1. 
Then we have a cost function, which uh, gives the sum of all of the immediate costs incurred by selecting controls, plus some termination costs. And then given an initial state x0 and a trajectory, the cost of the trajectory is given by this cost function. And our objective is to compute an optimal control sequence by minimizing over the controls at each stage this cost function. OK, so we showed this a little bit in lecture one, but the execution of this can be sort of viewed as a DAG, uh, a directed acyclic graph. So this graph is a set of states that are arranged in layers, where each layer corresponds to a particular stage. At stage zero, uh, it contains all of the initial states. And at stage one, it contains all uh, of the X, X1s and two, et cetera, all the way to the end of the, all the way to stage N. And then the last, the last layer has this artificial termination node called T. So the nodes corresponds to a state, two states, X, K, and each of these arcs corresponds to a state and control pair, uh, and where the start node is X, K, and the end node is X, K plus one. So in the case of this uh, X, zero, this arc corresponds to applying control U, zero at X, zero, and we arrive at X, one. Also, an, or an arc corresponding to X, K, U, K has a cost, G, K, X, K, U, K. Uh, and our objective is to try to find a trajectory from X0 to T that has minimum length. So the sum of all of these arc lengths should be ideally minimum. So the problem is equivalent to finding a minimum cost shortest path from X0 to T. So there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a knowledge check question that I always like to ask students every year. If this is just equivalent to finding a shortest path in a graph, and we know of uh, efficient shortest path algorithms, then why for finite state deterministic finite horizon problems do we need approximations at all? Why can't we just apply our efficient shortest path algorithms directly to this graph, come up with the optimal solution and be done? Anyone want to guess? Sorry? It doesn't matter that there's no cycles. That actually makes it easier. What do you mean? I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Problem that has structure. Well, a, a, any any finite state deterministic finite horizon problem has this structure. Yeah. Yeah. So why can't I just run my efficient shortest path algorithm on this? Dijkstra or Bellman Ford or whatever. Because like Dijkstra is a general algorithm for they don't in Dijkstra they also they, they don't assume the structure of the graph, right? No, we know this structure is fully defined. Yeah. Here. No, in, in any finite state problem, unless unless you don't know the transitions or the costs or whatever, but suppose you do, like for like a for example for like a any combinatorial optimization problem. Yeah, but don't say that this this graph is the most specific structure of the graph. Why not we use this more now which is the about the problem? It's like we don't want something about this problem. Still, the problem could be really, really hard to solve, but why? Okay, I'll just tell you. Uh, all right, so let's think about your uh, traveling salesman homework problem. So when I'm running, uh, if I decide to run a, a Dijkstra's algorithm on this graph, uh, I'm going to be, uh, this, this graph consists of all the states of the problem, right? But what were the states in the traveling salesman problem example? So the states weren't, there wasn't one state per city that, so it wasn't the city set. It was a set of partial tours. It was a set of permutations, partial permutations over all cities of which there is astronomically many. There's more than exponential of them. So I would be applying an algorithm that runs in polynomial time in the size of the state space, which is just gonna be, a, uh, the result is gonna be 
horrible. It's, it's going to take forever to solve this problem. So we have to introduce approximations. I mean, it's specific because you, you thought that's efficient. That's why like, I was going to think that, say that answer. But you, you, then why did you call uh, your shortest path uh, solution as an efficient solution? Because it is. Because because I can give it an arbitrary graph, and it will it will compute a shortest path uh, in time polynomial in the size of the graph. But what I'm, my point here is that the size of the graph is enormous. So it's not good enough. OK, so we have to introduce approximations. Okay, for first yeah. Okay, great. So speaking of combinatorial optimization problems, uh, let's look at this problem called the N Queens problem. So what is this problem? Uh, you, you may have heard of this. It's, it's kind of used as like a uh, an AI benchmark sort of thing. Um, but you're given this N by N chessboard and you're given a set of n queens. And your objective is to try to position the queens on this chessboard such that no queen is threatening another queen according to the rules of chess. So if you remember, a queen uh, can move uh, as much as it wants side to side. It can go up and down like this. And it can also go as far as it wants along the diagonals. So we want to find a configuration that positions all n queens on the chessboard such that you don't have this uh, threat, you don't have any, uh, any pair of queens that are threatening each other. So an example of such a configuration looks like this. So here, uh, if you look at any of these queens, there is no queen threatening that queen. So this is a n queens feasible configuration. So how do we apply uh, rollout to these combinatorial optimization problems? So if you have a, a problem that you can say represent as an integer program, we consider each of the variables one at a time in some order, and we assign a value to these variables. So in the case of n queens, we'll start out with an empty variable assignment. So the chessboard is empty. Then we're going to look row by row, uh, starting from top to bottom, and we're going to assign a queen to that row. So if I start with an empty chessboard, I have, well, I have four options for row one. I could put it in one of these four spots, but it turns out that uh, due to symmetry, uh, placing it either here or here is enough because it's, it ends up being the same thing uh, if you extend this to four positions. So we're going to look at two positions, either in the corner or uh, in the spot next to the corner. So here's two, poss two control possibilities for uh, a variable assignment for the first row. Suppose I come down here uh, and I choose to put the queen in the corner. Then uh, I have to pick where the queen is going to go in the in row two. So there's two possibilities. Uh, well, I can't place the queen here or here because that would mean this queen would be threatening either of these positions. So I basically have this option or this option. If I put it in this option, uh, then when I go to try to assign a queen to row three, I see that there's no place that I can place a queen uh, that is not threatened by some other queen. So we call this a dead end position and we assign it a high cost. There's From this position, there's no way to complete the variable assignment such that you get a feasible end queens assignment. Okay, so that's a dead end. We give it a high cost. In this case, one is sufficient. Uh, likewise over here, if I put the queen here, then that's okay, it's not being threatened by another queen. Uh, I can put another queen here without it being threatened by some other queen. And that, that's the only option from this point. But if I try to assign a queen to the fourth row, uh, I find that I can't. Uh, there's no place for me to put the queen in any of these four positions that it won't be threatened by some other queen. So this is another dead end position and this has a high cost. Now, on the other hand, if I place my initial queen here, then it turns out I have one possible place to place the next queen. I have one possible place to place the, the queen in the third row and in the fourth row. And what I end up is with a, a, a feasible n queens assignment. And this is a trajectory with cost that's low, in this case, zero. So a minimum cost trajectory in this graph corresponds exactly to a feasible n queens assignment. Um, I'll say a couple things about n queens. Uh, it turns out it's actually trivial to find like one n queen assignment. Um, 
but finding like the number of n queen assignments given a given an n by n chessboard uh, is not trivial. Okay, so that's one example. Yeah. Sorry. So you said you oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So uh, so if we started at this initial state, we would do this look ahead to the positions that we can place the queen. Uh, these correspond to variable assignments. So in the case of rollout, like U1 would be the uh, uh, position of the first row, exactly. So we would do this uh, look ahead uh, and repeatedly apply rollout until hopefully we found a, a feasible end queen's assignment. I, I, I guess like because these are like... Um the degree of integer decision, like the I feel like interpretation of the rollout is a bit more complicated because like such a numeric value might be the obvious. So you can apply rollout to any discrete optimization problem. So it's as I said, you, you consider the variables of your integer program one at a time. You may end up like in this position here, this dead end position where you find a path that violates the constraints of the problem. And this is a this is a dead end position. Okay. So it, if if I if, if you remove if you prune all of these paths that don't that correspond to infeasible solutions, then uh, rollout can find a feasible one. Okay. But, but, but like, uh, my question is that you know the the formula given for rollout doesn't seem like you know I, I feel like what you apply you apply the just based on the rules, like, you know, how would the formula for the rollout be easily applied for something? So the controls correspond directly to variable assignments, and the states correspond to a partial variable assignment. So here, uh, this is an empty variable assignment on top, and then we, one by one, assign these variables. So the state space is the set of all partial variable assignments, and the control is uh, to assign a particular variable to a certain value. Okay. I guess yeah. I guess that's the part that you know for these kinds of I guess destructive problems. This is maybe the difficult part to make sure that we like, we change it to a code. Like it doesn't seem intuitive. I mean, it is for this problem, but I guess yes. So as you said, like, so we have to the direct impact of the instructions into like how the rollout should be. Well, I mean, you can do this for any. Uh, discrete optimization problem. You can do it for knapsack. You just go through each item one at a time and you decide, do I put it in my sack or do I not? Okay, it, it has a, a similar structure for any of, any of these problems. Okay, okay. Uh, so the general, this is the general structure of uh, deterministic rollout using some base heuristic. Uh, it'll generate this uh, trajectory up to a current state XK, and then it will consider all possible controls at state XK. So in this case, it's UK, UK prime, and UK double prime. And each of these controls uh, leads deterministically to a next state, uh, XK plus one, XK plus one prime, and XK plus one double prime, respectively. So at the state XK, for every pair, XK, UK, we generate what's called a Q factor. A Q factor is obtained uh, like this. So if we're looking ahead to say this state, xk plus one double prime, we run this heuristic to the end of the horizon and we obtain a cost from that heuristic. Then we add the immediate cost of being at state xk and applying the control uk double prime. So this is the q factor. So the heuristic cost, which we define with this function, uh, h of k at a state a xk, plus the immediate cost is given this definition, QK uh, tilde. Okay, and rollout is going to select the control UK with minimum Q factor. Then we move to state XK plus one, which is determined by the minimum Q factor. And we repeat this over and over again until the end of the horizon. Uh, there are multi-step look ahead versions of this as well, as I mentioned a couple of times. But an important question is, uh, is rollout cost improving uh, in the sense that it's going to perform no worse than the base policy? The base policy could be anything you could think of. It could be something stupid. It could be something random. And we want to know uh, what are the conditions that we need to impose on the base policy 
so that we can guarantee that rollout at the very least is going to perform no worse than the base policy. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Oh, actually not. We're gonna talk about uh, another combinatorial example before we move on. Uh, so this is a problem that I uh, am very familiar with. This is called uh, the multi-vehicle routing problem. So we're given some network and we're given a set of vehicles, which are represented by these red trucks. And we're also given a set of tasks, which are represented by these little yellow money bags. And uh, the objective here is to compute a set of trajectories, one for each vehicle, uh, such that each of these tasks is visited at least once by some vehicle. And we want to make these trajectories of minimal length. So that, that's the objective here. So let's choose a base heuristic, uh, maybe one similar to the uh, nearest neighbor heuristic from the traveling salesman problem. This is going to be a base heuristic where each vehicle moves towards uh, its nearest task. So vehicle two, its nearest task is this one at node seven. It's two steps away, but the one at node nine is significantly farther away. And uh, due to some symmetry here, vehicle one, uh, the nearest task here is uh, the one at node seven again. So this is two steps away and this is three steps away. So the uh, nearest task to both vehicles is this one at node seven. So what does the base policy do? Well, each vehicle is gonna to move towards its nearest task. So when we execute the base policy, both vehicles one and two are going to move to node four. And by the way, I'll mention how, uh, how we charge costs here. We're going to charge a unit cost for each vehicle movement. So if both these vehicles move to node four, that's a cost of two because both of the vehicles moved once. Okay, so once they move to node four, the nearest task for each vehicle is still this uh, task at node seven. So they're going to move here and incur another cost of two. And then after that, the nearest task is down here. So they each move here, a total of five steps according to the base policy. So the total cost of the base policy is 10, two vehicles, five steps each. Okay. Now, what does rollout do? So at each stage, the rollout algorithm is going to look at all pairs of uh, next vehicle, possible next vehicle positions. So vehicle one is here and vehicle two is here. Where can each of them go in the next stage? Well, vehicle two could move to node five and vehicle one could move to node three in the next stage. That's one possibility. Another one is vehicle two could go to node four and vehicle one could go to node three or vehicle one could go to node four or vehicle two could go to node five or both vehicles could go to no go to node four, which would correspond to the base policy. So there are four possible Q factors here. Now I already did the one for the base policy. We know that that one had a cost of 10. Uh, I won't do all four Q factors, but I'll pick one that I know is good. Uh, let's pick the Q factor where vehicle two goes here to node four and vehicle one goes here to node three. So using this Q factor as a starting point, we then simulate the base policy. We don't actually move the vehicles, but we simulate the cost as if they were there and to obtain a, a heuristic cost. So if both vehicles start here at four and three respectively, then vehicle one uh, will move towards its nearest task according to the base policy, and it will go to node seven, complete the task. Vehicle th uh, one, starting from node three, will move to node six, uh, but it won't complete a task. At this point, uh, vehicle six, uh, vehicle one will be at node six, vehicle two will be at node seven, and there will still be a task remaining. Vehicle two will see uh, this task at node nine, and it will continue in the direction towards the shortest path towards it. So in, this, in the next stage, vehicle two moves to node 10, vehicle one moves to node nine, and then the problem is solved. So the cost of the base heuristic starting from this Q factor for three is four because each vehicle uh, moves two positions according to the base policy. And then the cost of moving to this Q factor is another two because both vehicles had to move uh, one position each. So uh, the cost of the base policy we saw was 10 and the cost of the rollout policy we saw was six. 
So rollout, uh, it turns out this is the minimum Q factor. In fact, uh, moving along these paths here corresponds to the optimal solution. So rollout will choose to move vehicle two to node four and vehicle one to node three. And then we repeat this calculation again, simulating the base policy in the next, in the next stage. You guys have any questions about how this works? Okay. Here's another problem. Uh, this is called the uh, search for an N arc breakthrough in a path in a tree. So this is kind of like navigating through a maze. We start at a root node and we're gonna navigate N steps through a maze. Uh, here it's represented as a binary tree and these crosses on an edge represents a blockage in the tree. So we can't move through these. Uh, and our goal here is to search through what's called a breakthrough path. It's one that looks like this, where there's no obstructions. Um, so let's consider a greedy base heuristic on, uh, on this tree. The greedy heuristic is, if one arc is free, use it. If both arcs are free, then only use the right arc. And if neither arc is free, you're already in a dead end state anyway. So here, if I execute the greedy heuristic, uh, the heuristic tells me uh, to move right because both arcs are uh, free. And the heuristic causes me to immediately arrive in a dead end. If I were to try to solve this with uh, exact dynamic programming, the complexity would be O of N times two to the N. This is because uh, we know that this tree has N levels and the number of leaves at each level doubles as each level uh, continues down. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a tree like this, uh, the number of leaves corresponds exactly to the number of unique paths in the tree starting from the root. Uh, and then, so we would, in the exact dynamic programming algorithm, we end up considering each of these paths and having to compute a cost for them. Uh, and it takes linear time to compute the cost for a particular path. So that is the complexity of the DP algorithm. Uh, uh, it's exponential. On the other hand, uh, the complexity of the greedy algorithm is just linear because if I'm at a particular node, I have to make exactly uh, two computations. I look to see uh, what's left and what's right, and then I can immediately move to the next node. So the complexity of the greedy algorithm is going to be two times N because the length of the path is N. Uh, rollout, on the other hand, uh, at each of these uh, layers in the tree, it's going to perform two base heuristic calculations. So it's going to run the base heuristic twice at each level of these trees, of this tree. And we know that the base heuristic requires linear time to solve. And so the complexity of the rollout algorithm is O of N squared. If you assume that these arcs are blocked with a, with a given probability. So like if you generate a, uh, a random graph or a random tree, then uh, it can be shown that the rollout algorithm has an O of N times higher probability of finding one of these breakthrough paths. So the greedy algorithm I showed you in this case, it doesn't find a breakthrough path and the rollout algorithm might not find one either. Uh, but the rollout algorithm has a, a linear factor higher times probability of finding one in the case where these edges are, are uh, blocked with a, some fixed probability. Uh, the, analysis of this, the analysis of this you can find in your textbook and the cited literature. But the point of this slide is to show that this is a qualitatively typical example of, thing, uh, of what you can expect from rollout uh, in general. There's no guarantee. But uh, rollout improves the performance of the base heuristic substantially at the uh, expense of a polynomial amount of extra computation, which is something that you uh, saw in your homework assignment, I guess, two and one as well. Any questions about this one? Yeah. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't. Con rollout won't consider every single path in this tree, and so it might find itself getting in a in a dead end state.
No, rollout is not guaranteed to find the optimal path. It's not guaranteed to find a breakthrough path. What we show or what, what can be shown is if the edges are blocked with some probability, the probability that rollout finds a breakthrough path is much higher than the probability of the base policy of finding a breakthrough path. Well, rollout doesn't, it's not going to look at all possible paths. And so there might be, it might be the case that in, a, in an arbitrary instance of this, there might be one, exactly one path that brings you all, uh, that, or exactly one breakthrough path. Uh, and because rollout is dependent on this uh, heuristic, the heuristic might lead it astray early on. Um, and so it may never see this path. But in the special case where we're generating this random tree, uh, you can show that the probability that rollout actually finds a breakthrough path is much larger than the base heuristic. Yep. Uh, so how does it, like, when you go for, you're looking one step ahead here, doing your rollout, and yep. then just doing reading from like the second step. Yep. Uh, but in that case that you mentioned where you get stuck because you didn't find, you didn't follow the right path. Like, so is it no, not just looking at is the greedy heuristic on one or the other given answer? Is it like the length of the path, maximum path that gave it something like that? So if it, it so okay, so you, you could assign like uh, in a similar way, uh, the dead end states could have uh, could lead to a, a very large cost. So yeah, if if it does like a look ahead and it sees that the cost is very low, then that's like a, a promising direction to look for the uh, breakthrough path. That's not always it isn't just always going somewhere where it can like find the path. Right. Uh, so the point steps here is non-mission. So the the time to roll out is to the end. Well, it, so the the height of the, this is an n arc path. So the height of this tree is n. So it's trying to traverse each level of this tree and find a path uh, that is unobstructed. For example, if you are in the, you get the first choice, and then you're on the left, uh, the top node of the left tree, and then you just roll out to the end and then choose the next one for what? So you, you repeatedly do this one step look ahead and you do the minimization. And then once you move to your next state, you just repeat this process again. You do another one step look ahead, run the base policy and figure out what your next state is. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna look at the uh, cost improvement properties of rollout and then we'll uh, take a break. So, uh, Cost improvement is not something that just automatically happens with rollout. Uh, there are special conditions that must hold to guarantee that the rollout policy performs no worse uh, than the base heuristic. And these uh, two of these conditions are called sequential consistency and uh, a more general one is called sequential improvement. Uh, we say the base heuristic is sequentially consistent if at a given state, it chooses a control that depends only on that state and not how we got to that state. Uh, in other words, if the heuristic generates this sequence starting at xk, uh, xk plus one all the way to xn, then if we start at xk plus one, the sequence that it generates is necessarily the tail sequence here starting at xk plus one. Uh, another way to think about this is the base heuristic is sequentially consistent if and only if it can be implemented with a legitimate dynamic programming policy. A legitimate dynamic programming policy is a sequence of functions that depend only on the state and output a control. Um, greedy heuristics are sequentially consistent heuristics. Uh, for example, the nearest neighbor heuristic in the traveling salesman problem. That's only dependent on the state, and we pick the next arc according to the minimum cost. Uh, so we're going to focus on the less restrictive condition, which is sequential improvement, which is the more general case. Okay, uh, so the sequential improvement condition, uh, informally it sort of means this, uh, the cost of the rollout policy is at most the cost of the base heuristic. So here's the definition. The best heuristic Q factor is at most the heuristic cost. So if we take the minimization over the set of controls of the immediate cost plus the heuristic cost at the next uh, state, XK plus one, this needs to be at most the cost of running the running the heuristic at state xk for all k. So this needs to apply to all xk. 
if this condition holds for all xk, then the heuristic is uh, sequentially improving. So rollout upon reaching uh, xk tilde, it has, okay, so let me uh, uh, preface this with this. Uh, I want you to think about rollout as an algorithm that generates a series of trajectories. And I'll, I'll make this more clear with an example in the next slide. Uh, it starts with a base policy at the initial state. And then by doing this minimization, it generates a sequence of trajectories that have this property. Uh, the cost of RK is at least the cost of RK plus one. So the uh, cost of these trajectories that it generates is monotonically non-increasing. Uh, okay, so here we have uh, this trajectory generated up to state XK. And uh, we do our look ahead, uh, UK versus UK tilde, and we obtain the base heuristic cost, and we do this uh, minimization to produce a new trajectory that has uh, this monotonicity property. So the cost of RK is at least the cost of RK plus one. So the current trajectory cannot get worse. Uh, and R0, which is the trajectory generated by the base policy at X0, it has this property of being at least the cost of Rn, which is the rollout policy, the final policy given at the end of the algorithm. And since all of these intermediate uh, inequalities are true as well, uh, then this inequality holds as well. So uh, I said that the sequential improvement property was a more general version of the sequential consistency uh, pr uh, property, meaning that if your heuristic is sequentially improving, it may not be necessarily con uh, sequentially consistent. On the other hand, if your heuristic is sequentially consistent, it is necessarily sequentially improving. Uh, and this can be seen by the fact that uh, if, you're con if your heuristic is sequentially consistent, then if you're at a particular state xk, the heuristic cost of xk is going to be exactly equal to the heuristic cost of fk plus one, plus the uh, immediate cost of the action just, uh, prescribed by the base heuristic. And because rollout does a minimization over, and, a, and it, its minimization calculation includes this particular action uh, pre prescribed by the base policy, um, then, the, then the trajectory that rollout produces can be no worse. Um, oftentimes it's much easier to verify that your heuristic is sequentially consistent rather than sequentially sequentially improving. This is a bit harder to verify. On the other hand, if you can verify this, then you get sequential improvement for free. Okay. So let's look at this familiar example. And uh, this is meant to illustrate the idea that uh, rollout is generating a sequence of trajectories. Okay, so again, we're gonna be using the nearest neighbor base heuristic. At the initial state X0 at city A, we use the base heuristic uh, to generate the initial trajectory. The base heuristic says, uh, move to the city with the lowest immediate cost. So in this case, the smallest edge weight is one, so we move here. Three is less than 20, so we move here. And then from there on, we have no choice. So we get this trajectory R0 that has a cost of 28. So that's the initial trajectory. Then we run, then we run rollout. Uh, so from A, we do this look ahead to states, uh, the cities B, C, and D. Uh, from city C, we already ran the base heuristic. And from city D, we get a cost that's pretty large. But from city B, uh, we run the base heuristic and that requires us going to the lowest uh, cost arc. So the base heuristic tells us to go along this way. Oops. So the second pol or the first policy generated by rollout from the base policy is this one on the outside. So this one is going to correspond to the smallest Q factor of all of these states. And so rollout is going to tell us to move here. And then this is the first policy that rollout generates. Then, uh, Okay, and then the cost of this uh, Q factor is uh, 27. So it has a smaller cost than this one, and it certainly has a smaller cost than this one. Then we repeat this process. So from city A, from uh, partial tour AB, we look ahead to the next cities, C and D. 
uh, from here, we have no choice. So we get this trajectory uh, of cost 21 plus the immediate cost is 22. And then from here, uh, we again have no choice and we get this heuristic uh, or this trajectory with heuristic cost four and we add the immediate cost and we get a cost of eight. And we compare these and then rollout tells us to move here. So this is the Paul, this is the trajectory R2. So we started with R0, then we obtained R1. And then as we move through this state space, we obtain R2. From here, uh, there's no further choice. So we continue down and the policy does, and we don't generate a new trajectory anymore. Um, but as I've demonstrated, we have this sequentially consistent heuristic and I've shown you that the cost of R0 is strictly greater than the cost of R1, which was strictly, strictly greater than the cost of R2, but you don't necessarily have to have uh, any improvement at all. What the guarantee is, is that you won't have a, you won't generate a policy of greater cost than the one that you had before. But in this case, you actually see cost improve. Are there any questions about this slide? So, so uh, when you do roll out for R2, uh, uh, if, you, um, uh, if you already see that the first cost, like, like let's say this one, uh, uh, imagine that um, uh, that one C, uh, you, you go from no rollout, uh, from big uh, uh, policy to rollout one. Do you still do rollout one if the first cost of the first, uh, like if that one was 100? And at your base policy, your, your base cost was like uh, of the total line, was let's say, as we said, 28. Do you check, okay, well, do I still do this 100 and see the nearest? Or do you say, okay, I see this 100, so no matter, no matter what cost, I will cancel? So I, you can't make a, a decision, to, like you're saying, that, like if this edge cost was 100 or something? Because in the... In the you do one to the world out, you know the decision you made first. Of course, you check AD, AC, and the uh, AB, mm -hmm. because maybe at AD the subsequent ones are, are less. But if you see that the cost from A to D is greater than the, uh, just from A to D is greater than what you got as the total cost of the base heuristic, do you still consider a, a, AD or not? So if you're starting at A, you, you definitely want to consider all of these Q factors. Uh -huh. Okay, but, but, but at the base policy, we got 28, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. This, I see that from A to D, it is 29. Well, the, I do the so, so, okay, okay. So, so the cost of this arc is 20. I know yes. I know the cost of, of this one is 28, right? So if I if I look ahead and I run the heuristic, um, so like let's say that this arc was still four and this arc is still three, and the heuristic is going to return this cost of 43 and then plus 20 and this Q factor is going to be 63. It might be that this arc cost is zero. And, right. right, yeah. But, 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 but our original 29, it came from going A, B, right? So my, my question was, if, again, from A to D, if it was greater than the total cost, like if this A, D was 29, then it was greater than that 28. Then do we cancel that part from the beginning and then that's okay then? Because it is uh, 29? Well, we're, we're, go we're going to follow the path that corresponds to the smallest Q factor. So if it's greater than, if it leads you down a path with, that has a Q factor with greater cost than some other one, then yes, we, we, do, we don't go that direction. I think this question is like AD, this edge itself is already like yeah. wider than the, the, the middle, like than the base heuristic. Uh, exactly. Maybe you could do some exactly. kind of like, well, I mean, rollout doesn't tell you to do that. You could maybe, depending on what your problem is, you could do some kind of pruning. You're saying like, if this edge here exactly. has a greater cost than, than your- entire base uh, Then, okay, then maybe you could save some computation. Uh, but like, uh, all of the two, uh, this may not be the first edge. My point is that, let's say you go two edges, it's already greater. Do you stop or do you have to go the whole path? If you just go A, D, then whatever, A, A, you know, because uh, I feel like, uh, like, so for me, that, that's what, what I thought I'm done. Yeah, okay, so you could ca you could cancel your base calculation earlier, uh, your base policy calculation earlier from a from a Q factor uh, if you find that the cost is getting too large. That's, that's an optimization you could make. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can I comment on that? What you mentioned is essentially that you know the total cost of some basic risk, yeah. which essentially imply you are doing some sequential execution of different branches. But you can imagine a situation where rollout are well committed or parallel application where you allocate specific application node for checking both A, B, A, C, and A, D. And in that case, rollout have no way to know beforehand whether or not this tag itself is larger than the CDC cost of some other projections. Particularly if you want to check, that means you are improving some intermediate rate computation to different nodes, which is not necessarily ideal thing. So essentially depending on the computation approach you use to carry out the rollout and so on. Of course, what you mentioned is uh, it's uh, it's a nice way to cut down computation if you only have one node to carry out this uh, calculation sequence. Uh, can you explain the sequential consistency yeah. using this as an example? Well, when I'm when I'm at a particular state, say, uh, okay, say I'm at state A. Well, actually, that's a bad example. Say I'm at state A B. Uh, I'm going to pick uh, the next uh, when I when I pick my next control. All I care about is the fact that I'm in state A B. It doesn't matter that I was in state A before because all I need to know is what state I'm currently in to choose the next arc of minimum cost. So this is sequentially consistent because it's not dependent on any state that I've been in in the past. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, take a break. And uh, if you have more questions at the end of the break, we can take some time to answer them. Uh, otherwise, we'll continue with the uh, last part of the lecture. So we'll meet back at um, 557. Okay, uh, let's get started again. Uh, are there any questions coming back from the break? Okay, yep. In the uh, like you said, oh, you guys could use a rollout as a uh, reinforcement learning technique, but like I just have a conceptual question that is the rollout really a learning technique because it doesn't seem like you're learning something with it, right? Like it's a solution technique, but what is the why would the rollout be considered a learning, a reinforcement learning technique? Well, it, it depends on how you define learning, but I, I showed how rollout generates a sequence of policies that have uh, non-increasing costs. So if you think about learning in that way, in that it's learning from its lived experience and generating a sequence of trajectories, each uh, no worse than the last, and in many cases much better than the last, then you could think of learning in, in that sense. So uh, some I, I, I've seen uh, reinforcement learning defined in a couple of ways. Uh, one way you can think about it is approximate dynamic programming, and we use those terms interchangeably in this course. Uh, another way is uh, learning through lived experience, but uh, I wouldn't say that reinforcement learning requires you to implement some kind of neural network or something like that. Um, uh, or, or, like maybe it's easier for you to see like why Q learning is like learning because it's using this like gradient based technique to update the Q factors of a state. Uh, but that's not the only reinforcement learning algorithm. So it depends on how you define learning and it depends on how you define reinforcement learning. But if you think of reinforcement learning as approximate dynamic programming or uh, uh, learning through lived experience, something like that, then uh, I would call rollout a reinforcement learning algorithm. The only question I have to add is, like, I think that learning is that, you know, after you learn, even if you go to a new task, you you still can like when you as you said teach a neural network or like even other algorithms, they don't only learn to solve that specific problem. They, they may generalize, but it, it, like I don't think rollout like rollout only works on your initial condition, right? Because you go from an uh, it works it works on any any initial 
special condition for any problem, and it, its performance is going to be uh, dependent on how good your base policy is and what are the properties of your base policy. But it has to be executed. It doesn't carry. It's an on, it's it, it, it's an online algorithm. And does that be excluded from being learning that we are now? But it doesn't store for the next problem. I can't imagine why. Okay. Okay. Any other pro any other questions? All right, cool. Uh, okay, so in the last part of the core uh, the lecture today, we're going to look at uh, deterministic rollout variance and extensions, and we're going to uh, touch a little more on uh, sequential consistency as well. Okay, so uh, the first variant we're going to discuss is called simplified rollout. Uh, so to motivate this, think back to the Wordle example, Wordle example from one or two lectures ago. Uh, what did we have to do there? Uh, at each stage, we needed to choose a five-letter word as a guess, right? And then we got some kind of feedback that says, oh, these letters are uh, in the word, but they're in the wrong position. Or it might say uh, that this particular letter is in the correct position, but we get some kind of feedback. But what about at stage zero, uh, we have to pick uh, some initial word. Uh, how many words can I pick that are five letters long? Uh, about 12,000 in the English language. And although you get some feedback uh, from the Wordle game, uh, as you continue to guess, the, the size of the control space is still very large. OK, so. That, motiv that motivates this simplified rollout algorithm. So instead of computing a control with minimal Q factor, we use any control with Q factor that's less than or equal to the heuristic cost uh, given by HK. So when at XK, we choose the rollout as a rollout control, any control that satisfies this inequality. So of course, the minimum control will satisfy this inequality, but maybe that's not the only control that satisfies this. Um, so in this way, we focus on a small subset of promising control to save computation. Uh, in the case of Wordle, uh, I'm not sure how they do it or, or what mechanism they use, but uh, they reduce this control space down to like uh, 15, 20, or 50 words, something like that, instead of 12,000. So they use a form of simplified rollout. Uh, OK, so does the simplified rollout algorithm have this cost improvement property? Uh, so let the rollout policy uh, of, under the simplified algorithm be given by pi tilde, and let jk pi tilde xk denote its cost starting from state xk. Then it's really easy to see, because you're picking the controls exactly in this way, that this inequality is satisfied. Uh, so the proof is, is sort of trivial. It's, it's easy to see this. The cost of R0 is at least the cost of R1, et cetera, all the way to the cost of Rn. So this is a way of saving computation when your control spaces are excessively large. And remember, Wordle is a game, and it's played online. And you're expected to come up with a response within seconds, because I think your score is based on a timer, if I remember correctly. I might be wrong. No? Am I making that up? OK. Anyway, it's a game, and it's played online. OK. All right. So the next is called Rollout with a Super Heuristic. Depending on what your problem is, uh, it may not be obvious uh, which is a good heuristic to use as a base policy for your rollout algorithm. In fact, that there, there may be multiple heuristics that uh, work better under certain parameter settings of your problem. So one idea is to consider combining several heuristics into a thing called a super heuristic. So the idea is to construct the super heuristic heuristic which runs all of the heuristics at each state encountered, and it'll select the best out of the trajectories produced. So you run many heuristics, and you select you use the heuristic corresponding to the smallest Q factor. So the super heuristic can be viewed as the base heuristic for the rollout algorithm, and it can be verified using the definitions that if all of your heuristics that you are using are sequentially improving, then the same is true for the super heuristic. And this is uh, not too hard to see. So the first step for the proof is to write down the sequential improvement condition for each of the M heuristics. So uh, this superscript M 
uh, corresponds to the heuristic uh, M in this set. Um, and then by taking the minimum over M, so we apply the minimum over M to both sides of this inequality, and we uh, interchange the minimization, uh, we get this expression here, which is the minimization over the set of controls. Uh, and then we minimize over the uh, heuristics, uh, over the different heuristics, and we get this inequality, which is precisely the super heuristic Q factor. So we run each of these heuristics, we take the minimum, and then if 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 the all of the heuristics are sequentially improving, then this inequality holds as well. And this is the proof. So the sequential improvement condition holds for the super heuristic as well. So this is one thing to consider if you're thinking about doing your research project. Um, okay, so that's that variant. Are there any questions about this one? Or the simplified rollout? All right. Okay, so here I want to give a counterexample to the cost improvement uh, uh, to the cost improvement property of rollout when in the case where the uh, sequential improvement condition does not hold for the base policy. So suppose you're given this uh, control problem and you have this state x0, and if you apply control u0 star, you go to state x1 star. And if you apply uh, u0 tilde, you go to state x1 tilde, and then the rest of the, the, the problem looks like this. And suppose the optimal trajectory is this trajectory given in blue. And assume that the uh, heuristic tells you from, if you're starting at x0, it tells you to pick u, u0 star. And then if then when you're at uh, x1 star, it tells you to pick u1 star. So in other words, the heuristic, if you're starting at x0, tells you to do the optimum thing, OK? Uh, however, if you start at x1 star and you run this heuristic, it tells you to do something different. It tells you to go along this edge. Uh, to x2 tilde and tells you to pick this control uh, u1 bar. And this edge has a really high cost. So this heuristic is not sequentially consistent. Uh, if I start from here, it gives me one trajectory. But if I start from here, it gives me a, a tail. That, or it, it doesn't give me a trajectory that is a tail of this trajectory starting at this state. So this is this this heuristic is not sequentially consistent. Now, what happens if we apply rollout using this as our, our base heuristic? So we start at x0, and we do a one-step look ahead, and we consider control u0 star and u0 tilde. And from each of these respective states, we run the base policy. From here, x1 tilde, there's no choice. We just have to go this way. From here, the base policy tells us to go along this edge. That's what the base policy says. So. Uh, and this edge has a high cost, so rollout will choose uh, this control as the minimum control, and the rollout policy will tell you to go this way. Now, uh, but we know that uh, the base heuristic starting from this state also happens to be the optimum trajectory. So you can see that the in, in the presence of this non-sequentially consistent heuristic, uh, the cost of the rollout policy here actually must be greater than the cost of the base heuristic. Um, okay, so that's what this says. And then, so in the absence of sequential improvement, uh, rollout can deviate from an already available good current trajectory. So this suggests a possible remedy. Uh, the idea is to follow the best current trajectory found, even if rollout suggests following a different but inferior trajectory. And that brings us to fortified rollout. So the objective or the uh, uh, aim of fortified rollout is to restore the cost improvement property for base heuristics that are not sequentially improving. So here's the idea. Now we saw that rollout generates a sequence of trajectories. And what we're going to do is at each step, we're going to follow the best trajectory computed so far. So we're gonna keep track in memory whatever the current running best trajectory is and its associated cost. And if rollout tells us to do something different, then we're going to disregard rollout and follow our, our current tentative best trajectory. So at a state xk, 
uh, in addition to the permanent rollout trajectory, so from X0 to XK, these are decisions that we've already committed to online. So this is a part of the permanent trajectory. Uh, we also store the tentative best trajectory, which is uh, in this diagram is given by this trajectory here. Then if uh, rollout when rollout does its look ahead, it's state XK, suppose uh, this state here corresponds to the minimum Q factor. Well, we reject uh, the minimum Q factor choice UK tilde if its complete tra trajectory is more costly than the current tentative best. Otherwise, we accept UK tilde and update the tentative best trajectory. So this is handy if uh, maybe you don't know something, like if you have some heuristic in mind and then maybe it's the best thing you can think of, but you, have, but you can see that it's not consistent and you have no idea if it's cost improving. So then fortified rollout might be a good candidate variant uh, for applying to your problem. Okay, so let's look at the same example as we as we saw before, but instead of rollout, we're going to apply uh, fortified rollout. So uh, as before, uh, starting at X0, we found that the uh, rollout control corresponded to this trajectory here, but uh, we uh, have this initial trajectory, which is which we keep track of in memory. So when we do the one step look ahead, we see that this state here corresponds to the minimum Q factor and we obtain a cost for it. But then we compare it to the uh, tentative best trajectory, which we obtained initially. And we see that this tentative trajectory has a higher cost or sorry, a, a lower cost. Uh, so we discard the rollout control and we simply move to X1 star instead of X1 tilde. And so in this way, we overcome this problem and we and in this particular example, we uh, end up with the optimal trajectory. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, are there any questions on any of the variants that I've talked about so far? I'm going to talk about one more, and then we're going to finish up the lecture. Okay. Uh, the last variant is called model-free rollout with an expert. Uh, this one is interesting. Okay. So if you have this uh, general discrete optimization problem, which I, I talked about earlier, you have uh, controls that are corresponding to variable assignments, and you have this cost function G, uh, which you give the variable assignments to, and we want to choose variable assignments such that uh, the cost function G is minimized. Uh, okay, so starting at a current partial solution, uh, rollout looks ahead one step, and it runs some base heuristic to the end. And ideally we get a, a cost obtained here and we can choose the minimum Q factor and continue. But what if we don't know G and what if we don't even necessarily know the constraints of the, uh, uh, the constraints at UK? So instead, uh, oops, we have a base heuristic, which given a partial solution U zero to UK, it outputs all next controls UK plus one tilde and then generates from each a complete solution. And this is done using a human or software expert. There's some expert that can, uh, given a partial trajectory, uh, make a complete trajectory somehow. And then there's also a uh, 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 an expert that is capable of ranking any two trajectories. It's, it can say this trajectory is better than this trajectory. Well, in rollout, all we're looking for is the minimum Q factor. And if we have some kind of ranking system, whether it be a human or a software expert, these are all of the ingredients we need to, uh, to perform rollout. So the point here is, is that we can even use rollout uh, in the case where the cost function is unknown. Uh, and I'll show uh, an exa a real world example of that. Um, okay, so this is called the uh, RNA folding problem. And then there's this paper from a couple of years ago, uh, I believe worked on by, by Professor Pitsikas, um, where they used rollout with an expert to solve this RNA folding problem. So the problem, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skim over a lot of details, but the, but the high level picture is this, uh, given a sequence of nucleotides, which are these molecules of type ACGU, we're going to fold them in an interesting way to produce an interesting structure. 
And by folding, I mean, we're going to take pairs of them and connect them with each other. So uh, we're going to look at a partial folding at each state. Uh, and then we're going to make a decision, uh, one of three decisions. So suppose this is a partial folding. Here are two uh, molecules that have been uh, paired with each other. And this here is an open pair. So at a state XK, given a partial folding, we're going to make one of three decisions. We're going to either close an open pair, we're going to do nothing, or we're going to open a new pair. So uh, earlier in the sequence, at this molecule, we decided to do nothing. Here, we decided to open a new pairing. Here, we did nothing. Here, we closed an existing pairing. Here we did nothing, and here we opened a new pairing, and now here we're trying to decide uh, what the next thing to do is. So the base heuristic uh, in this case was is is uh, will complete a folding uh, using some kind of software, and then the same software can be used to compare two complete foldings and uh, say which one's better. Uh, it's not generally agreed upon what makes a folding interesting or which foldings are better than others, but this software has some way of doing that. Um, okay, so this is just an example of uh, a specific application where there's no explicit cost function. And the software is, uh, the expert software computes not only the base heuristic, but also the costs of a particular trajectory. Uh, I would think that this kind of thing would also be useful uh, in the context of large language models, where it can be difficult to evaluate how good a string is relative to another string, uh, depending on the context. So maybe that could be another potential application for rollout with an expert. Are there any uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, can you say you can compare them pairwise to be like round robin? Or you could do like a tournament. Yeah. Anything else? Awesome. Okay, so that is the end of this lecture. So uh, next time, we're going to continue this series of lectures of going into more depth. Uh, we're going to look at uh, rollout with multi-step look ahead, and we're going to look at rollout for constrained problems and applications to integer programming. So we'll see more discrete optimization problems there. Uh, there's a new homework assignment that's due in two weeks. Uh, this is a programming exercise, and it's related to the spider and flies problem from a previous exercise. So this is a stochastic multi-agent problem, and you'll be asked to uh, make three different implementations. So given a specific instance, which we identify in the book, uh, we're going to ask you to compute the optimal solution. Uh, remember, this is a stochastic problem. Uh, and then uh, we're going to ask you to implement rollout. Um, and then we're going to ask you to implement a, uh, a variation of rollout called multi-agent rollout, which we're going to go more into in next lecture. But for now, you can think of it as a form of simplified rollout. So you'll be implementing these three algorithms and uh, running them on a specified instance. Um, regarding your project, uh, I think it was yesterday or maybe a couple of days ago, I uploaded uh, the guidelines for your project on Canvas, so you can go and access them uh, under the file section. Uh, so please go and read them. Uh, and if you uh, have questions or need clarifications, uh, please send us an email. We're going to ask of you that by the end of spring break, that you send a you send us a one page or less proposal about your term paper about your term paper. Uh, there are two possible options. There's the read and report type paper, and there's the mini research project. For the read and report type paper, we're going to ask you to look at uh, a particular subfield of reinforcement learning that interests you and uh, look at various literature regarding the subject and uh, write a report on it that involves some kind of synthesis or, or possibly includes directions for future research. Uh, on the other hand, if you choose a mini research project, uh, we're going to uh, want you to perform some kind of novel research on a new problem, not, a, not an existing paper that you've already written. Uh, for the proposal, in the case of the read and report type, uh, we'll ask you, um, we want to know what is the, the subfield that you're interested in, 
and we'll ask you for a tentative list of references uh, for what you plan to read. In the case of the mini research project, uh, we're interested to know what problem you're thinking about and what kind of method methodology you're thinking of using. And uh, also please include a, a tentative list of references that are, are relevant to this. So send us that by the end of spring break. Uh, you can email these directly to uh, Professor Bitsikas and uh, please email uh, you Chow and I, or uh, sorry, CC you Chow and I. Um, are there any questions? Yes, they're on Canvas right now under files, the 2024 project guidelines. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks, guys. Um,